Live, everybody. Hey, uh, welcome to Red TV in Conversation. I'm Peter Clark. Uh, don't let some of that long hair footage fool you. It's really me. Here we are. It was stuck in the, in the 80s, uh, 1987, slippery when wet. But I digress. There I am. Uh, hey, really glad that you're here. I super appreciate you tuning in. We have an amazing show today. So um, right away, thanks for being here. Uh, super pumped to have you. If you're here for the very first time, uh, probably tuning in for that uh, beautiful soul over there. Hey, glad to have you. I really appreciate that. Uh, if you're back again and you know what, you already know what you're in for. So I appreciate that even more because uh, that means you already know, which is fantastic. Appreciate it so much. Um, hey, if you like what you see, it's simple as that. Um, Red TV, we want to lift all the boats. That's what we want to do. We want to inspire people, tell great stories. And that person over there is going to tell a great story today. And uh, we want to inspire people to do better. That's what we're doing. We're lifting all the boats, everybody. So if you like it, share, please like and share with your network. That'd be awesome. I'd super appreciate that. That's, there's the sales pitch. That's it. That's all you're getting from me today about uh, anything like that. Please uh, uh, share with your network and uh, and let's spread some good around. Okay, let's do all that. Uh, I'm super pumped today. Listen, I'm pumped all the time. You know that, right? But I mean, there's <laughs> some people you meet. <laughs> you just You just go... I want to speak to that person. I want to hang. I, I want to know this person. I want to learn more. Uh, I want to know what she's all about. Um, fantastic story. Just an amazing story. Um, there's so much to cover here today. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, purpose. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, philanthropy and business as a force for good. We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of things like that. Very, very important subject matter right now in the world uh, where we have a collision of all these things happening. Um, and we'll, we're going to dig into that. So let me stay with me here. I'm going to try to slow down here. Normally I'm very, very excited. So I'm going to slow down and try to get in everything of who I'm going to be speaking to, uh, right now today. So I'm really uh, pumped about this. Uh, first of all, she is the chief impact officer. Yeah, you know, I know you can read over there. It's already there. I know you see that chief impact officer at Benevity, and which is a unicorn. I don't know if you know what a unicorn is, uh, in, in the business term, uh, but they're a unicorn in the global technology sector. So that means basically they have a valuation of a billion dollars or more without being on the stock market. Okay. That's, that's a, that's a dream for any start, uh, startup, uh, tech company. Uh, they've been around for a little bit, so uh, they're not exactly startup, but they're, they, they're still falling in the category. Uh, they're a leader in global corporate purpose software. That's what they do. Providing, uh, the only integrated suite of community investment and employee customer and nonprofit engagement solutions. I'm telling you, you know what they're doing. They're also a B Corps. Uh, check that out. What B Corps is all about a designation. Of course, that's the meeting the very high standards of uh, performance, accountability, and transparency. Super cool stuff. They help hundreds, hundreds of global brands uh, with their corporate purpose programs. That's what it's all about. You know, they help uh, attract. Uh, so these these programs, of course, with uh, with these companies that help attract uh, engaged workforce. They, they help uh, people uh, retain people uh, that they, you know, they're trying to bring into their organization. Um, it, it basically embeds social action into customer experiences and helps people and organizations to positively impact their communities and the world. <laughs> I know I'm saying a lot. There's a lot in here. Uh, they've even attracted the financial backing from two, two, more than two, but two of the world's leading social impact funds with people like Bono. Bono, do I need to add who the band is? I do not. I do not. One person, Bono or Vice President uh, Gore doesn't have a band, but he has a lot of influence. That's for sure. Listen to these stats. Listen to these. Uh, Benevity has processed more than $8 billion donations. $8 billion, sorry. $8 billion in donations. Okay. Help companies and their people track more than 43 million volunteer hours. 
and half a million positive actions. Boom, right there. Uh, all in support of, listen to this number, 326,000, give or take, nonprofits around the world. Can you imagine? Okay, they're connected. It's a really big company. Hey, and when, you know, when she's not out saving the world, she's a mom to a, a Labradoodle. Labradoodle, Gracie. I know she's there. I know Gracie's there somewhere. Uh, she loves to travel. And uh, she's versed in something that I'm fascinated with. Teachings of Carl Jung. I don't know if you know about this. Okay, Swiss psychologist, founded analytical psychology, all this stuff. Very smart person. Uh, very, very smart person we're talking about right now. We got so much to cover. Uh, we got to get going here. Uh, please welcome everybody. Sola Kosla, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I, I mean, I could have used the show just to introduce you. <laughs> I'm not that interesting, Peter. <laughs> yes, you are. Come on. Good to see you. Yes, you are. Great to see you too. I'm excited. Did you recognize that person I was talking about in there? I mean, I know yeah, you recognize totally. the company. Yeah, you recognize that person in there and you recognize the company, of course, right? Which is uh which is super cool story. We're gonna to try to cover a little bit about Benevity, obviously. Um, uh, this is your life's work right now as we speak. And um, and but we also want to talk about you and what you, and how you kind of got there and some of the things that have uh, influenced you as well. Uh I wanna make sure that everybody know. Hey, listen, here we are from uh, people tuning in all over the world. Hopefully, here we go. Like, boom, from Denver. Uh, good to see you, Kevin. I uh, love this. I always love, hey, always good to see you, Daniel. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I think he's some, somewhere in the U.S. So, <laughs> I think he's in Florida, uh, but he's there on vacation. I think that might be it. Uh, look at this beautiful name. Uh, Sona, look at this. Oh, oh, that's so great. I mean, I know this person. I know yes. this person. Yeah, I like that person. She's super cool. By the way, she has gold. Cool. Little secret, haven't even told anyone yet. She's going to be on the show. Ah, that's excellent. Yes, I'll, be, I'll tune in for that. Please do. She, oh, she's something else. Ah, uh, she is something else. Uh, good to see you, Ed. How are you, my friend? Good to see you. I'm just, hey, I just want to let you know, Sona, it's not just me and you. There's people here. There's really people tuning in. <laughs> Massachusetts, Melody, thank you for tuning in. Melody does a lot of great work with PTSD and that sort of subject matter. Oh, wow. So, uh, again, you know, again, connecting all of the people that are doing good in the world. Thank you, Melody. Always, always good to see you. Tim, thank you for tuning in, my friend. He, he has a show about cancer and he helps people tell their stories about cancer. I mean, come on. It's all good yeah. stuff, right? When you have good people doing good stuff, I love that. And Matt, right in our backyard here in Calgary. Good to see you, Matt. <laughs> it sounds like I know everybody, Sona. But they do. It, well, no, it's just people tune in. They tune in and, <laughs> and I appreciate when they do. I I, I love it. And uh, this person must be tuning in for you. Uh, excited to be here. Does that look like a name for you? Has to I be. don't know, but they I tune welcome. In they, they tune in. They tune in. <laughs> They tune in for the guests. Okay, first of all, we always have to start. Um, uh, how are you and your family? Everyone okay? Everyone safe and happy and sort Everyone's of great. No complaints. Oh, okay, that's really, really good. It's just been a crazy couple of years. I just want to. Uh, I always have to ask that. I know for me, <laughs> I, people know my story a little bit. Uh, I had a kind of a scare in December, so everything's health. Health is wealth. Uh, that's yeah. what we got to talk about. Health so is wealth. It is so true. Uh, and I, I want to make sure that we never belittle the fact there's a lot of people out there that probably aren't doing so good. So uh, if you're one of those people, hey, we're cheering for you, okay? That's what we're doing. We're cheering for you today. Hey, before we get going, uh, I want to show you something. I, I just love this. And you've got great energy. Uh, by the way, you've got great hair. Just so throw it up for the right. Hey, thanks. I washed it today. I did <laughs> it. I mean, this is rock star stuff. I mean, come on. <laughs> I just love that. It's just like 80s. It's just, hey, I'm stuck in the 80s with my hair. But I love it's it. It's big, it's, man. It's big. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the personality you got it you got to have a big personality to wear that i promise you right there hey look i want to show you uh, these are remind cards remind okay. cards. and uh my beautiful spouse uh she's just awesome Ren you renuka you met her you met renuka yeah, yeah she beautiful soul oh you just described her you just <laughs> she was a beautiful soul i know you guys had a good conversation when we met out in banff i know that she she, she, she brought me to tears well you guys just connected. Yeah, she she has a, she has an old soul. There's no doubt about it. Hey, I'm going to shuffle these cards, um, and we're going to set the intent. Let's just see if we're set a little bit of an intention for today, and we'll okay. see what it, what it plays out to be. Just for a bit of fun. Here we go. I'll do. You just tell me when to stop. Very random. Okay. Stop. Stopping right there. I'm going to take it right off the top. That's all I'm going to do. Let's just see what happens here. <sighs> One of my favorite words in the world. I mean it. It's a weird word. Congruence. Oh. congruence now i'll tell you why here so it says uh, take time to reflect on your thoughts words and actions are they aligned align in these areas uh, uh, sorry alignment in these areas creates harmony in our lives it can help us live more authentically and enhance our overall well-being 
congruence. Now for me, Sona, I'll tell you why I use congruence. So there you go, everybody. Uh, there's the uh, remind card. Thank you, Renuka Mohan. That's fantastic. Uh, congruence, the reason for me is like, when you think about business, for example, uh, a lot of people talk philanthropy in business uh, and vice versa. Some people talk a lot of philanthropy that they claim to be in. And I, I'm just, I'm, I'm not being cynical. I'm just saying. Uh, so my idea of congruence is when you're when your mind, your mouth, your heart, your wallet, and your feet are all moving moving in the same direction. That for Absolutely. Me, yeah. Know. Okay. So I just wanted to share that with you. I just thought it was cool. Um, hey, listen, it's it's just a lot of fun uh, is the main thing here. We're just going to be plugging away at uh, all kinds of things, subject matters we're talking about. I got to start with this question with you. Um, uh, because I talk to a lot of leaders, uh, business leaders in, in, in for-profit and non-profit world. Okay. So let's start with this one here. And, I, and there's no right or wrong with this definition, but the word philanthropy has been used. It's a 5,000 year from what I, I've researched mm -hmm. a little bit, it's thousands of years old, uh, this word. And, you know, it has basis of for the love of humanity. Uh, yet we think it's uh, aristocratic, you know, it's, uh, it's people at cocktail parties writing checks and these kinds of things. And, and I love the idea of reclaiming that word and so on. So I just wanted to toss that out there for you, philanthropy. What does that mean to you? What, is, what, is, what does philanthropy mean to you today? Well, I think it's exactly as you described it. That's how, um, how we think about it. When we think about philanthropy, it, it does feel like it's, you know, um, high net worth, big philanthropy. Those are the words that tend to come to mind. So you think about um, the, the larger than life celebrities who are writing, you know, millions, sometimes billions to um, to good causes. I, I think, you know, what we tried to do with Benevity anyways was say, you know, philanthropy just doesn't feel that accessible. It doesn't feel like something that maybe just you and I can do. And so we actually adopted the term goodness uh, very intentionally to say, you know what, uh, philanthropy has got a phenomenal intention, a beautiful definition. It's simple and beautiful, um, but it just doesn't feel accessible. And so we wanted to Think about something that was a little bit more all, encomp all encompassing and, and a little bit more inclusive, actually, right? Something that can feel like anyone can do good, anyone, and it and it doesn't it it isn't about writing a check like that was exactly what you described. Writing a check, that's what we think about, yeah. but that's not what it is anymore, especially now, right? Like when you think about how Gen Z might define doing good, it's totally different than the boomer generation who may still be writing checks. Um, and, and that's great. Nonprofits need that financial support. Um, so I don't want to diminish that. It's, it's actually critical. They can't do the work they, they do without that. Um, but, you know, people in, in, the, in the newer generations or people who are adopting kind of new technologies are looking at how can I use my voice? How can I use my platform? How can I do one good thing a day? You know, how can I make different choices in the products I consume? How can I make different choices in the way that I live? Um, and congruence is actually one of those things we're really seeing is people want to live in alignment with their values and their purpose. Um, and so, yeah, so philanthropy, we, uh, we get the term, acknowledge it, support it. I mean, part of our software at Benevity actually does support corporate philanthropy. Uh, we're not against it. We're highly supportive of it, but we, we think that there's something bigger and more all encompassing and inclusive. I love that. And I love the idea of, of, of goodness, like just doing good. I think you're absolutely right. When we, when we can think about it, we just think our, we, when our actions, we talk about this congruency, your actions, speak with your actions, uh, you know, vote with your wallet kind of thing. What, you know, uh, these are the things that people can relate to. And, and you're right. There's something aristocratic about it. I still love the word. I still love talking about the word philanthropy and, 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 and trying to reclaim it back to that. Um, and it always reminds me of a story where my cousin one time told me who volunteers all the time. She says, I'm not a philanthropist. I just volunteer. Volunteer. And I said, yeah. but that, I said, that's, you're donating your time, which is even the greatest asset you can give to someone Truly. in the world. Right. And, and so this idea of like, oh, I'm not a philanthropist. It's like, no, I think you are. And uh, so see, people it, don't want to, don't want to associate themselves with that either, which is really interesting, which, you know, isn't there, there's been a lot of research and a lot of people don't want to um, seem boastful or don't want to claim um, because it feels like it diminishes the goodness, right? Um, but I, I do think philanthropy has a bit of that, if that's not me, that kind of energy. Um, and whereas goodness is something you might lean into and say, yeah, you know, I did a little good. Yeah, I, I think I made 
someone's day better today by volunteering. Yeah, no, you're hit it, you hit it on the head. I, I, that's why I'm glad uh, to, like, I love the idea that you, you recognize what it is, uh, philanthropy and you talk about it and you have, uh, services, products and services with Benevity to, uh, address that directly. But this idea of engagement with, with, uh, employees and so on, which we're going to talk about, uh, super important. Uh, this idea of doing good seems to resonate with, uh, with people quite easily. Here's the website, everybody, just to make sure everyone knows, uh, Benevity.com. You can go there. You'll find all kinds of resources. It's unbelievable. We're going to, I'll, I'll bring the website up in a minute so we can have a look at it and so on. Let's talk about, um, a chief impact officer and Benevity Impact Labs, just just so that people kind of put in context of kind of who you are and what you do. Just, you know, give us this Coles Notes version of, of a little bit about Benevity Impact Labs so that people understand uh, some of the things we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, like you mentioned, you mentioned in your intro, Benevity is uh, not a new company. We've been around uh, since about 2008. And, um, and so we've amassed, you know, a pretty incredible community. We have about 900 companies using our, pl our platform, our software to power their goodness programs or their purpose programs. And um, what that's done is we've actually had the incredible privilege, I would say, of working with some of the most iconic brands and really seeing what it is that they do to propel more, more goodness, more purpose, more, more impact. And um, that's that's a pretty unique perch to be on and, and a pretty unique view to have. And then, of course, because we're a technology platform, we also have a lot of data. Of course, we don't sell that data where, you know, it's 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 we're all about the ethical use of that data. But part of that ethical use of that data is also thinking about how can we use it to help change more minds, help people see the the opportunities um, in making an impact and learn about what is happening and what works and what doesn't work, maybe. Um, and so when so about a year and a half ago, we decided to spin up uh, an incubator, a social incubator that would share uh, our data, our research, our insights that we get from our unique perch uh, to help people really understand how purpose is evolving, shifting um, and and adapting to these, you know, to this new world. And so that's kind of our way of, you know, giving back to the world in a way by sharing um, some of the, the, the resources and, and knowledge and data that we have. So that's primarily what Benevity Impact Labs was intended to do. Oh, well, that yeah, that clarifies it for me. But I've been on your website a little bit. I'm telling you, the, like you said, I love data. I love stats. I love numbers. I love, uh, you know, the interpretation of them, trying to figure it out. How does it apply to me? What does it mean for me? Because, uh, I mean, we, we we all need to speak from the eye. I mean, it's easy to say people do this and people do that. What do I do? What do I, how do I see the world? How can this information help me? How can that, how from what I'm learning through this information that you're gathering through these, like you said, something like 900 uh, companies, uh, I think it's something like, what, uh, hundreds of millions of customers, 20 million employees or something? Is that what yeah, it is? Yeah, those, those companies represent about 20 million in, in, in employees hundreds of millions of customers and we've got nearly 2 million nonprofits from around the world. So it's a pretty amazing ecosystem. Right. So when you collect data uh, from from that sort of uh, base, um, that's 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 that pretty much is a good snapshot of what's going on on the planet, not even just in a region in, in the planet. And I think that's what uh, this is all about. I mean, everything we're talking about right here really has a global impact of what we're talking about. It's not something that's regional by no stretch of the imagination. Uh, Appreciate that. Let's talk. Let's jump right in. This. There's so much to go. So I got to keep moving fast with you. I told you this already. So I apologize. I like it. I, we just got it. We got so much to talk about. We got so much fun stuff. Corporate purpose. Uh, you know, one of the uh, and I'm going to bring it up in a second here. Uh, the report that's there uh, that you have on the website. People can download this. The state of corporate purpose uh, for 2022. Fascinating stuff. I mean, I just love that stuff. So, uh, but let's talk about that uh, corporate uh, purpose. I think. Um, you know, the, the definition of it right now, this idea of, of there's a perfect storm happening. That's what basically has happened over the last couple of years. There's no doubt about that. Basically where there's a collision where there's lots of people in need, obviously, and that's, 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 that's nothing new to anybody. I think the last two years just amplified it. Uh, you know, people wanting to do good, philanthropy, this idea of charity, giving back, making a difference, and then the corporate world and that structure. So all of these forces are coming together and they're, col they're colliding and business leaders that, work with, you know, Benevity, uh, they understand uh, how many stakeholders are involved in that mix. They really do. Uh, so the, the report of this, it's called the State of Corporate Purpose, and I'll bring that up in a second so people can see. The report shows that there's five trends in corporate purpose. So I'm going to bring it up. I'll bring those five up for us just to kind of uh, uh, review very quickly. But talk about corporate purpose. When, when someone says that, 
I, it almost sounds like you're disconnecting me as a person because I'm not a corporation. Yeah. So corporate yeah. purpose, purpose, talk to me. What, what is that? What does that mean? Yeah, you know, I, I, we've actually kind of wondered, is that the right term or not the right term? But ultimately, why, why we've used it and why we believe it's important is um, corporations today have a very different expectation, right? People expect them to not just uh, pursue profits, but to actually make a positive impact in the world. And so we see corporations as, as almost aggregators of, um, you know, resources, assets, um, strengths skills and and then they've got reach through to the entire globe right like every single person in the world has a connection to a company in some way whether they buy from them whether they work from them uh whether they you know so there's everyone's connected to a brand in some way and so we felt that um it was important to redefine what's been traditionally known as corporate social responsibility which is companies giving back and it's this sense of uh, obligation or responsibility, um, where the corporation is acknowledging that you know they want to support the communities that they operate in. Sometimes they do it for that license to operate. Um, you know, you see that a lot. Um, and so, but you know, in the world has changed, and um, it's no it's no longer this top down kind of you know um, world where people at the top determine what matters to people anymore. That has totally changed, right? I think the internet completely democratized that and um, and so we we felt like, well, what could it be? What could the world look like if corporations actually empowered all of their people, customers, vendors, suppliers, employees, to bring their passions and purpose to work and actually enable that and potentially reward that and incent it? how much good could we actually do? And so that's what corporate purpose is, is it's much more about, um, you know, using the reach and resources of a company to have a positive impact on the world and much more from a bottom, bottoms up, grassroots enabling kind of way. So that's, um, yeah. that's why we, we're, we're excited about the term and it's, it's catching fire, you know, when you see, um, when you see Forbes and Fortune talking about corporate purpose in this way, we get really excited. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, you, you know, you, through all of my reading about it and so on, what, what you just said actually really clarified it for me. I, 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 so it's almost, you know, we're not redefining corporate social responsibility. We're just sort of looking at it a little bit different where it's more of an inclusive uh, a feeling where we're, we're again, the employees, for example, feel that they're really connected to um, what the, what the organization stands for and what it supports, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, feeling disconnected where corporate social responsibility sounds like I got to do something. I'm responsible for this versus like you said, leaning in and getting involved and being more uh, connected that way. Let me bring up those five trends um, while we're continuing this conversation. I think again, this is part, part of this uh, report, everybody, uh, you can go on the website and download this. Uh, uh, so let's let's talk about it because I, I do want to zoom in on one of them. Uh, there's so many, listen, we could do full shows on every single one of these. Uh, but let's just talk about these five that seem to be the trends that come out of the report. Again, everybody, they're reaching out to something like close to 900 companies, 20 million employees, hundreds of millions of customers, uh, lots of data to pull from. These are the five that, five that seem to, to uh, stand out. Just let's briefly uh, t touch on each one of those. Uh, you know, good. To, so let's start with number one there. In times of need, businesses are stepping up. Generally speaking, what is that meaning when you say stepping up for, for companies around the world? Yeah, I mean, I think that the last few years have shown us that corporations and businesses, no matter what size, have a role to play, uh, you know, in, in crisis. Um, and so especially, but not just in crisis, but also sustaining change that um, becomes more obvious to us that's needed out of crisis. So for example, the pandemic or the, or the war in Ukraine. Um, or the Black Lives Matter movement, which showed us that you know racial inequity and injustice is still very much alive. Um, and so what we're finding is that companies are starting to take their role a lot more seriously and catalyzing action when, when it's needed. Um, and doing exactly what I described earlier, which is using their reach and resources to make that impact. So we saw you know, a number of companies, especially um, in, in the face of the Russian invasion on Ukraine, um, stepping up and doing donation matching, you know, up to the tune of five to one. And they were running these campaigns within 24 hours of the invasion. That's what's incredible. Like they're moving swiftly and they're moving intentionally um, and they're amplifying the impact that any individual could have. We saw corporations also, 
you know, rewarding any kind of volunteering. So you talked about your cousin who's, you know, volunteers at, at a nonprofit, but they, they also volunteered just, or sorry, they rewarded um, their employees who were just picking, you know, people up uh, off the streets and giving them shelter. So acts of goodness, not just volunteering for a nonprofit. So we're seeing businesses really um, start to prepare themselves to be ready for when crisis happens, Nat uh, natural disasters, political disasters. We've had our fair share of those, right, over yes, the last five years. And they seem like they're growing in frequency and businesses is, is really recognizing that they have an incredible role to play. Yeah, I, I love that because we, we again, we, you know, we can't always look just to government for answers. We can't look yeah. just to philanthropy for for resources. Um, again, and and we can't just look just to business as well. There's a there's a collective to all of those things. But yeah. the fact that big, big businesses are recognizing their role is super powerful. Let's talk about this this second one here, the root of the Great Resignation. That's a a big subject. Uh, uh, conversation in HR departments everywhere around the world or anything to do with human resources or capital resources. It has to do with the idea that people are have changed over the last couple of years. So this idea of the great resignation really being, uh, being easily defined into something called more like the great search for purpose. What do you what do you mean by that when you think that people are searching for purpose versus just quitting jobs? Yeah, yeah. So when we, um, you know, when you look at the data around uh, voluntary turnover or, or what they're calling quit rates, um, you know, they hit their they hit their peak uh, last August, and um, and what you when you peel back the data and look at the reasons for people leaving, there's a number of reasons, right? People looking for flexibility, autonomy, um, you know, boomers retiring uh, earlier. Um, Gen Z actually are younger generations or, or people who are entering the workforce looking for different kinds of work. Um, better working conditions has been a really big one. I want a higher quality job. Um, and so, but what's interesting is when you, you know, kind of cut across all those demographics, what you start to see is that people got in touch with what matters to them. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing like a, a global crisis that it was felt personally for every individual on the planet to kind of just take a step back and check yourself and say, you know what really matters to me during this time? Um, and people also finding their ways of coping during that time. Um, you know, I know for me, like being out in nature um, was critical for me. Like just, you know, we have, uh, we had 20 acres and, and so we go and just walk on the land and like, you know, be with trees. It was just really, really powerful. Um, but you get in touch with what matters to you. And I think you can no longer sit in a place um, that doesn't align coming back to that you know word congruence right and so i think that's actually what people are seeking is they want to work for companies where they can first of all align to the company's you know purpose they feel good about it but then they can also bring their own purpose and their whole selves to work or bring at least more of their 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 selves to work um, and live in a way that they can achieve those meaningful, you know, goals in their own life. So um, work is not just working for the corporation, work has to work for us, and our own personal search um, for what we're, you know, for whatever it is that we might be seeking. Yeah. Hey, you, you just reminded me of a, a really cool line that I heard uh, while you were out at the gathering uh, here in, in Alberta uh, from uh, MJ with uh, with Microsoft. She said, uh, you know, one of uh, her uh, mentors or leaders there said, don't, you know, don't work for Microsoft, have Microsoft work for you. So you're absolutely yeah. right. When people want to feel that they're engaged with something uh, that it allows that organization or whatever that entity to work for them personally so they they can be their best self so uh, i love that let's go to number three here uh you know obviously diversity equity and inclusion another giant subject matter that's just going to be around forever everybody and rightly so i mean let's face it rightly so so let's just talk about the employee-led action on uh you know diversity equity and inclusion um and the culture about the, the idea of of changing corporate culture from the bottom up and inside out talk to talk to us about that yeah, you know, when you look at um, diversity, equity, and inclusion over the last, say, 60 years, right, it really started to emerge in the 1960s, and, and uh, many of the, the approaches were um, oriented towards uh, limiting the risk uh, around liability and, and legal um, issues, right? And so um, many, of the, many of the approaches then were much more compliance-oriented. It was around you know, getting your training done, making sure that you know what's, you know, what's right and not right, um, and, and driving it that way. What we've found over the last little while, so, you know, we've had 60 years of this, 
and the stats didn't significantly change. Um, and, and our belief is that a compliance orientation to these things will never change behavior. Um, what's required to change behavior is a level of self-awareness, um, a level of empathy, um, and a desire for something better for everyone. And so um, what we've seen since the pandemic um, is that people are taking it into their own hands. Employees are taking diversity, equity, inclusion into their own hands. They're, no, they're still holding their, their companies uh, to, a high, you know, to a high standard. They're saying they're holding them accountable to all of the targets that they're setting. They're saying, yes, you know, you need to, you need to put in systems and operations and processes that don't discriminate, that don't, you know, foster bias. But I'm also gonna um, take it into my own hands. And what we're seeing is this like burgeoning of communities within companies, uh, right. whether it's, you know, a, a community of veterans or a community of parents who are working parents or, you know, your Latinx groups or your black groups. Um, and they're helping each other and supporting each other and understanding how they can thrive at work. And that's been this incredible, we get excited about bottoms up action, right? Because mm -hmm. we know the power that that can have. And so over the last year, we just saw a tremendous amount, like groundswell of these um, of these communities they are called ERGs, sometimes employee resource groups or affinity groups. Um, and they're just um, growing like crazy in corporations. And so um, we're excited about that because again, it just like CSR and corporate purpose, if you can have both a top down and a bottoms up approach that engages everyone, then that, that in collective action, then we can have greater outcomes. So that's just an incredible amount of employee led action on DEI and B. Oh, yeah. I like that analogy about the idea of from the top pushing down, the bottom pushing up. You come together a lot quicker, you know, when you kind of meet yeah. in the middle. It's kind of like left, right. It's all these conversations that seem to be out there politically, you know, it, whether it's spiritually, emotionally, personally, all of these things. We need to kind of kind of find a way to where we're walking towards each other. I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Let's go to number four here. Uh, the future of corporate philanthropy is stakeholder. Now, I just mentioned in in some of this this perfect storm we talked about that uh, the company that, that you work with uh, and Benevity works with really do understand there's multiple stakeholders here that, that are involved with the concept of corporate social responsibility and philanthropy. So talk to us about that. What does that mean about who, who are these stakeholders and, and, uh, and, and why is the future, you know, with, with them? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, when we look at corporate philanthropy, again, that's a very, um, it's been around a long time, right? Since forties and fifties. And so, and it's been very much uh, top down directed, but we're living in this world of stakeholder capitalism, uh, where, you know, many, you know, 200 CEOs uh, at the business roundtable said, we acknowledge that there is more than just shareholders. Uh, we have stakeholders who are our employees, our customers and the communities um, that we touch. And so what we're finding is that um, the approaches to traditional corporate, corporate philanthropy are also morphing and they're taking into consideration more of these stakeholders. So when we when we talk to organizations and see some of the, the ones that are on the on the real bleeding edge of, of corporate philanthropy, they're actually turning to their customers to help them make decisions, their employees to make decisions on who they grant to, what causes they give to, um, how much they give um, and, and how they give. Um, and they're also turning to people within communities who have those lived experiences of the people who they're trying to actually help. So leveraging that deep innate knowledge of people and saying, how can we better support these people or these communities um, in a way that's less about, um, you know, a company saying, I'm going to write you a million dollar check and here's what I expect from it. And I'm going to be able to brand it, you know the xxx you know whatever um pro our signature program it's like the, the level of engagement that's happening between uh corporations their stakeholders and nonprofits. the power dynamics have completely shifted and they're now all at the table um having these conversations in a more collaborative fashion and a more trust-based um fashion which we get again really excited about when there's kind of, you know, um, equal partners in power, um, being able to bring their strengths and, and resources and knowledge to the table. So what we're finding, and we've got some data on the website as well, that just shows how much customers and employees want to have a say in what the company is doing with its own dollars, not just their own, not just, you know, the dollars I give through my employee giving program or, you know, where I volunteer, but I also want to have a say on where my company gives 
um, which is, you know, I think uncomfortable for a lot of corporations. Yeah. Um, yes. Right? Yes. And, but, and I just got to say, like, I love what you just, you you were, you were saying there about this idea of of having all these the, the power structure has changed. We just talked about the concept of philanthropy and that word, and the, and and this aristocratic feel where people are like, okay, I'm not a I'm not a philanthropist. Uh, like you said, someone writes a check and then say, hey, I expect this to happen. Versus the conversation is now let's let's talk to the people who are actually in the on the front lines. Let's talk to the people who are yeah. actually doing the work, um, even if it's through a corporate structure, even if it's through a, a very um, rigid, sometimes uh, foundational structure, if you will, in the nonprofit sector, um, where you have board of directors and these kinds of things. Let's talk to the people who are actually doing the work and yeah. have that conversation where they're meeting together. So I love I, that. That just resonated with me when you talked about let's get all of these stakeholders at the same table talking yeah. about it, knowing that um, uh, Again, in essence, it's the person or the people uh, that are actually doing the work and that have an understanding of what the requirements are versus what I think it is if I just write a check and say, here's what I think you should do with it. Yeah. Uh, really a big difference. Uh, let's jump to ESG. E e Again, everybody, we're, listen, there's, we could put right there's five shows right there okay everybody just, you know uh so sona already knows that i just said hey listen we're gonna rock and roll with this thing but esg a uh, giant subject matter another one how state uh you know shareholders understand purpose now i think that's the uh, uh, one of the most powerful shifts that we've seen in, in in recent times just simply because the idea of the corporation and the only mandate it has which can be argued by the way can be argued that the only okay. mandate it has is to increase shareholder value i mean that that literally truly is the definition of it um yeah. But ESG, I think, and now how shareholders are seeing and understanding what purpose is. So talk to us about uh, the concept of ESG and how that helps a shareholder say, you know what, it's not just about profit. There's other things I need to consider when I'm investing in a company. Yeah, you know, I'm just thinking there's quite a parallel between ESG and diversity, equity, inclusion. ESG um, has traditionally been around risk, mitigate, risk mitigation, right? So um, ESG, by the way, stands for environmental social governance. And it's, um, it's a framework, although there's multiple frameworks that companies can adopt to say, okay, we're committing to these environmental standards or targets, these social standards or targets or these governance ones. And originally when it was, when it was conceived and developed, uh, it was really around um, recognizing that companies can have a major environmental impact. And so we need to hold them to a higher standard of accountability around that and they should report on it. Um, and so, you know, it was, and, and like, I'll give you the example of an oil company. What are the processes, you know, that they can put into place to make sure that there's no oil spill that would have a, you know, severe environmental impact. So that's kind of where ESG started. It's really changed. And what we're finding now, when you, when you measure um, the impact of, of companies that score high on ESG is that they're actually, they're more profitable. Uh, they have lower borrowing rates. They tend to um, engage their, have stronger employee engagement. Uh, they can price their products at a, at a premium. So they can make both top line gains, bottom line gains and cultural gains. And so what's interesting about that is it really proves that, you know, purpose can pave the way to profits. The, mm. the, thing, the thing that's important to recognize though is, you know, as soon as it becomes a business motive, it goes back into the shareholder value bucket. And so, um, so what we're saying is that actually, you know, companies again have an opportunity. So yes, there's these you know top-down frameworks that are that are important to hold companies accountable and and make sure that they're transparent. But how can you foster a culture within an organization or a community that actually lives up to the ethos of environmental, social, and governance? How do you foster that culture? How do you foster that behavior? What are the outcomes that we can drive um, with that? And you know, for, I'll, I'll use Benevity as a great example. We've never had diversity targets. Uh, we've mm -hmm. never set them, but you know, sixty percent of our executive is actually um, it, are women, and I think about thirty to forty percent are people of color. And so, but that's because we've focused on, you know, really what are the what are the behaviors? What is the change we want to see in the world? and modeling that um and you know our, our it's it's it works so that's kind of our point is that you know um that there is this idea of of, of esg but if you actually take more of a purpose-driven and engagement-driven approach and really think about it that way you can have incredible outcomes uh, you said it, that's fantastic i mean like you said esg it, it's just one of it's 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 
it's interesting when these words and phrases and uh, come around and and they start showing up and people are having these conversations and and you're hearing so much about it and you're thinking what does that got to do with me um you know if, unless you're part of a board of directors or something like that you must think well what is what does governance have to do with me what is but I, I, at least inside of there you know environmental and social we can relate to those kinds of things government governance like you said almost sounds like okay uh, processes and handbooks and how do i uh, stay compliant with everything uh versus the idea of social and and the idea of the environment which of course we all live in and that's where our resources come from and if you see for profit business you're out there using resources to turn them into things that we all purchase and and of course we can vote with our wallet it's just it's so interconnected isn't it i mean that's why i love this conversation it's so interconnected Hey, I want to bring you to, uh, I saw something uh, at the gathering. We're at the gathering and you did an interview. I snuck in. I snuck. I was there. I kind of snuck out. I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I not to heckle you. I was there. I was, I was, I was like, oh, they're going to do an interview with her. I want to sit and listen to this. Uh, but anyway, uh, the people at Microsoft, uh, they had a cool setup. Did they not? Come on. Oh yeah, totally. They cool so they, they interviewed you and you said something um that that uh, i so i took I, I went and took this clip and i just want to show you this quick little clip um yeah. about you uh, saying something and then i just want to ask you about what you specifically meant by that so here's a little something from uh the folk from microsoft. <laughs> microsoft advertising everybody that's what it is uh and a little clip from them from the gathering uh here in um Banff, Alberta, Canada, uh, this year, 2022. Quick little clip right here. I think, you know, we talk a lot about purpose. And the reality is purpose is personal. Mm. We each have our own reason for being or reason for living or things that inspire us or motivate us. And they often come from, you know, um, experiences that we've had in our life. So they're, they're deeply personal. Deeply personal. Well, let's, let's go right there. Um, you know, we have all kinds of life experiences, um, that drive us in that direction. As you said, uh, what is that one for you? What, what is, and it's probably not just one event. I'm, I'm thinking there's not just one, but why is, why is purpose, um, so personal for you? What is that? Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny, Peter, I'm, um, so I'm just taking time off work right now and I decided to take a month off, just take a little bit of a reset and, um, uh, the morning after my first, so I finished work and then the next morning I woke up and I was like, I need to do my will. <laughs> and it was just the most random thing that came up. But what was I shouldn't laugh. By the way, I, I didn't laugh at that. It's just like you said, that's a thought that comes up. But by the way, that's important, everybody. So uh, I, I don't want to diminish it because it's super important because yes, it's super important. I don't want to laugh. I just laugh because you know, I know I, it's I, random. I it's like, it. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to meditate. And write, But it's like the first thing that comes to mind is Sony, you don't have a will. You better get your will sorted. And I was like, and so that process has been really interesting because I've always known that um, I want to leave, you know, a certain portion of, of my legacy and, and my wealth um, to a cause. And it really got me thinking about, you know, what is it that matters to me? Because honestly, Peter, I haven't necessarily had a cause that I've felt like is mine. What I've loved doing most is amplifying the passions of others. So when people kind of come and say, I'm fundraising for this because, you know, um, there's a gal on my team, for example, whose mother has MS and she does the, the run every year. And I will always give uh, when she asks. And when, you know, when when things happen or there's causes that matter to people and they ask, I that's like, I love doing it. I, I max out my matching budget at Benevity doing that. Um, I do, you know, I, we have foster children, my husband and I like through, um, plan international and, um, support women in need here in Calgary, which is a phenomenal nonprofit. Um, uh, so, you know, we've got those, but what is it that really matters to me? And what's deeply personal to me is, um, I had a mental health crisis back in 2011, um, where, you know, I had been going hard, you know, hard in my career, hard in life. Um, I don't mean like, you know, substances or anything like that. Just ambition was driving me pretty hard. And um, I had this literally a moment where I fell into intense anxiety. Um, and it was so crazy because it was literally like I would wake up in the morning and I'd be panicking, but I could get dressed. I could get to, I could, I could get into my car. I would cry all the way to work. I could work. I could actually compartmentalize and work. And then literally I'd get back into my car at the end of the day. I'd cry on the way home. I'd be, I'd be, uh, my heart rate was super fast. 
Um, I was like hyperventilating um, and I was actually hallucinating at night. So it was inc like, it was unbelievable. Um, and I went to uh, an integrative physician here in Calgary, Dr. Bruce Hoffman, who I used to work with and said, you know, what is it? And he said, uh, anyways, he did a bunch of tests and he's like, he called me up one morning and uh, I was in my car actually. And he's like, so I just, you know, I, I want to tell you that the good news is there's nothing wrong physically. He said, but your unconscious is knocking at your door and I think you need to answer it. Wow. And that was like, I, I didn't really know what he meant, but that got me um, on this track of, of Jungian analysis. Mm -hmm. um, there it is. And there, there it is. I was wondering where there it is. It is. <laughs> uh, that's another shell right there. Just that. Uh, keep, keep going. Sorry, keep going. Keep going. Yeah. And so, you know, I've, I've been um, working in, in, in the Jungian way um, for the last, it'll be about 11 years now. And this is what Dr. Hoffman said to me as well. He said, you know, um, by the way, it's not like you're going to go in and be fixed in three sessions. This is lifelong work. And I didn't really know what that meant until I got into the process and realized that it really is about um, really integrating all parts of yourself and living with meaning and mm -hmm. living from, from your soul. And so anyways, that has actually become, I think, my passion. And the thing I dislike the most about Jungian analysis is that it's, uh, it's pretty expensive. And so it's not accessible. Uh -huh. And so part of what I'd love my legacy to be is to make it more accessible um, because I think it's a, a transformative methodology. So how I will do that, I don't know, but that came up in my will. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, hey, so coming hey. full circle. <laughs> okay, now we know. And listen, I, we're, it, it, people it's, people are hearing this message right now. So, I mean, we're, we're right now we're planting seeds for people that are, especially in your circle of influence, uh, that will say, Hey, I like what she's talking about there. And that's another thing that we can start tackling. Cause it, there's that legacy piece that we're all, you, like you said, this search, this, this search for meaning, this search for purpose, if you will. Um, and we talked about it earlier, uh, you know, this idea of, or just before we went on air, I was, I was talking about that idea of what your, what your passion is versus your talent and your gifts and these kinds of things, uh, fascinating stuff. So, uh, but I, I really wanted to understand that. I know there's a couple other things and we're going to touch on them later on, just so sure. you know. Uh, there's other things that have affected your life as well. Hey, remember that uh, beautiful young soul that I talked about and said, um, um, uh, I, I set up the, uh, the Microsoft, Microsoft room and, and all that kind of stuff. And you mentioned something earlier, we were talking about making something work for you. And I said, yeah, that's MJ. MJ said that where yes. you said basically have Microsoft don't work for Microsoft, but have Microsoft work for me. Um, hey, you know, um, I thought to myself, if there's any two souls, if there's any two souls I want to bring together in this world, you know who it is, don't you? There's them, David. How are you? Hi okay. there. Yeah, so good to see you, Sona. My voice is a little um, scratchy. Uh, I had a, too much fun this past weekend connecting with friends, so I'm not sick. It's all for good reasons. But so <laughs> good to hear you. I can listen to you all day long, and uh, you're my... Um, my soul sister, uh, purpose-driven soul sister. So, so <laughs> honored to be here and to be asked to be with you. Oh, oh my this gosh. is fantastic! I love. Listen, I just, I, you guys are I, just rock stars. Okay, you know that. So, go ahead, so I have to tell you, this is crazy, MJ. I was literally uh, in the shower this morning. I was like, we haven't heard from MJ. <laughs> like, well, I literally. <laughs> you know, you're you have a really good team over there. They protected your time. I actually reached out to try and connect with you, but they're like, she's taking time off. So I said, okay, let's set up some time. So August, early August, we have a connect on our, oh on our calendars. You should just call me. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to respect your time. Yeah, I'll, I'll call sweet. you. Okay. <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. Well, like I said, uh, I agree. I, I agree with you, uh, MJ. Is that uh, you, you, soul? So when I met you, I didn't. I didn't know either one of you when when we met uh, individually, and uh, I, instantly I, I sensed that yeah, there's there's some of this this is karmic connection that there's live. Magic. Yeah, there's magic with a K at the end of that. There's something super cool that's happening right there. MJ, thank you so much. I know you said you weren't feeling well when I reached out to you, and, and you said, but I still want to be there. And I think I know Sona would appreciate that. Let's talk uh, a little bit about uh, Microsoft and this this whole you know 
this what we're talking about with benevity doing good where this this these worlds are colliding right now people want to do good in the world they're working for companies or they want to work for companies that are doing good they want to have a say in that uh tell us a little bit about because i know you obviously microsoft is working with benevity if i'm not mistaken that's right. and so, that's right. so tell us a little bit about that that relationship and tell us a little bit about what's going on at microsoft where all of this is coming together yeah absolutely i mean we have a culture of giving at microsoft and every year um you know around october time frame we have a i would call it a huge celebration of um being able to spend our privilege at microsoft whether that's skills time or money and for us to scale that ability for us as uh, human beings who who want to help organizations uh, there's a platform that we use and it's benevity benevity is the enabler of uh, the ability for all 190,000 plus employees at Microsoft to decide what organizations uh, we want to donate to, what organizations we want to volunteer. Uh, and even I know our entire legal team does pro bono. Um, and in the last, I mean, it's, it's, it's ingrained in our mission. It's part of our culture and how we live out our mission, not only in the products and services and experiences that we create to empower every person and every organization to achieve more. But it's it's really everything that Sona was talking about is like looking for that sense of meaning and even legacy. We're so passionate about giving our time and our money and our skills to address the issues facing the world. And as you talked about earlier in this uh, conversation with Sona, it's not, uh, we're not lacking opportunities to step in and help around the world here. And I really believe it's our way to build our best collective future. And it's not just governments that need to solve this problem, but all of us. And so Benevity, um, just this past year, you know, like powered $214 million of dollars that employees at Microsoft in one year donated uh, to nonprofits, including our, our corporate matching. And also, was, I think it's like 560 70, no, 590,000 hours uh, by 22,000 Microsoft employees donate their time to nonprofits. And if you do some quick back of the napkin math, do that 590,000 hours and let's just say $25 an hour. I'm sure it probably is worth a little bit more than that in certain instances. But like this is over uh, $14 million in, in time. Uh, right. And that's not an official number. I'm just back of the napkin. So Benevity is just incredible. And thanks to the team at the gathering, uh, you know, I actually didn't know how that worked. And my team said, look at this, look at this chief impact officer, Sona. She's a badass. And her company powers Microsoft's giving. I was like, what? So I started <laughs> doing all this research. I'm like, um, this is the power of follow your passion and you'll find your people. And so the people at the gathering, right? They are following their passion. They're finding the people and the people have similar passions. We're all this big, I feel like we're this one big mm, movement. Uh, it's not just an event. It is a gathering, but I feel like they're creating a movement and allowing us like each other to connect. Oh, I believe that. And hey, you know who's watching here? Just so you know, there she is. <laughs> She's, Stephanie. she's yeah. watching she's watching as we speak so uh i'm so she's glad the maestro i think you know this is an orchestration right yeah. and stephanie i have to give her so much credit she's the maestro uh the conductor of the symphony and she's seeing these people and then looking at you know let's let's pull these folks together let's let's amplify their messages um and that's so much value there from those people and stephanie it is so true. No, that's true. It, it, it literally lives up to the word, isn't it? You gather together, you get a chance to have a conversation, and then these kinds of things happen uh, to be able to take it uh, to the next step. Uh, Sona, this must be pretty cool to kind of hear that, <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> I'm still like giddy. I'm just like the, it's so synchronistic. It's so wonderful. I am so, so happy. Um, and like, just, oh, thank you. But thank you for coming and thank you, Peter, for your inspiration. Like, it's just, it's awesome. But I think that's exactly, I was thinking about what MJ said earlier today, you know, which is find your purpose and you find your people. 
And it's just so true. Like literally meeting MJ was like instant connection. Um, and in fact, you know, someone on my team a year earlier had said, hey, MJ De Palma, I think we should have her at one of our conferences. You know, she's really got something. And, and I was like, <laughs> okay, yeah. And I listened to the talks and everything. And, and then I was like, oh my God, we're meeting. And it's just, it's wild. So, yeah. um, but it is, you know, I think I will say Microsoft, um, the relationship between Benevity and Microsoft goes back to about 2015. And um, we feel like we are, like when Microsoft celebrates, we celebrate. Like we just feel um, so inspired and so much a part of what they're doing. And, and you know, Satya Nadella, you know, when he says, let's make work the platform for people's passions, you know, come and, and let Microsoft work for you. I just think he's on to the right way of work. He just knows that this is where it's going. Um, yeah. And so I, you know, the other CEO who's like that, he's also, I don't know, maybe there's something in the water in Seattle, but uh, Francois Loco Denu from F5 Network, same thing. He's like, companies should be a platform for their people's purpose. And I just, when people live it like Microsoft, then you see what can happen. And I think I think every corporation should follow. And the team at Microsoft who leads these programs is absolutely phenomenal. They're trailblazers. They're, um, they're deeply committed um, to a highly inclusive approach as well. So it's no wonder they get so many people engaged. They have some of the highest participation rates uh, for a company of their size. And that's that's because they think right down to how do we get everybody, you know, bringing that passion. Yeah. See, I, I, MJ, I just wanted to say like, we had, we had a conversation uh, and, and thank you for that. We, we did a show or I know we're going to do another one, just so you know, uh, <laughs> and, yeah, <laughs> I just put it out there. Um, the idea is that um, Microsoft, and we talked about this, so I just want to touch on this. And I think uh, Sony, you can address this as well. I don't want to eliminate, you know, smaller businesses. I don't want to, people to think that we're just talking at a really, really super high level. When you start talking Microsoft's of the world, I mean, you know, the, 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 these are just totally different. They're they're almost they're almost they're in for the average person. They're just a distant thing. They're just so big of an entity. It's it, Microsoft is is kind of like you know again other other brands that are are bigger than life. So I don't want to I don't want any small business people, anyone who's uh, working for a, a company that may be regional or local, not to feel that they can embrace this idea of what you're talking about, which is passion purpose and finding that mj talk to that a little bit if you can just the idea that you're not just pulling this off just because you're microsoft and have the financial awareness you actually have the buy-in of the leadership and and you have a vision for that so if you can speak to that just a little bit so we can make sure that we're not just talking the super uh elite companies uh, uh, the blue chip companies out there that uh, uh smaller ones feel that they can do the same thing it's such a great question and I think it's important to bring that up because our whole mission is to empower everyone. So it doesn't matter if it's a, a large organization or a small organization. And the movement that I've created is based on research. And that research indicates to build trust with people, I believe the relationship between a small business and their customers, it, you look at it in the same way as a large corporation and, and, and their customers as well. Or, And in, that is like building a friendship. And when you meet someone for the first time, whether you're a small business or a large corporation like Microsoft, there are mechanisms that, that are going on in our, in, our, in our psychology and just how we decide whether or not to trust someone. And trust is an interesting thing because, you know, it's not about being everything to everyone. It's about being who you really are. And when I say who you really are, your business. Um, and so how do you demonstrate there's three core building blocks of trust? And I'm thinking about like, as you build a friendship with someone, you know, how are you being responsible? Are you showing up when you say you're going to show up? Are you doing the things that you say you're going to do? And that That is just a foundational um, elements to building a friendship. And then do we have shared values? Again, it's not about being everything to everyone, but do we have shared values? That creates the sense of meaning. And from a small business standpoint, I don't think you're in a better position to, to build this sense of your purpose in the community and what you're doing to serve that community. And you probably have employees that live in the community. And last but not least, 
inclusion and that peace in building, you know, a friendship that is long lasting, that loyalty factor, you know, you're a person for someone like me, like you get me. And on the flip side, it's a, think about it as a, you know, instead of a person in a business, you're, you're a business that is for someone like me. You understand my problems, my, my challenges, and you strive to like include me in a solution that, you know, is something that is of value that makes me feel like, God, I'm not alone. And I get to maybe even live a better life because you're around. And that is really how I see it. I don't see small business any different than a large corporation. The principles of building a great relationship is the same. Wow. Super well said. Gosh, that's a, uh, oh, I'm going to click that out. <laughs> it's going all over the internet, everybody, just so you know. I'm going to clip that out. Uh, Sona, speak to that as well, if you can. I mean, I think it's really super important. Again, the, the messaging here is that, of course, you can your software and your solutions and, and things can can support, uh, you know, companies like Microsoft. Uh, but but I think there's there's room for everybody in there somewhere for Benevity, correct? Absolutely. You know, I think um, I love that MJ went to trust. Um, because that is, you know, business still is the most trusted institution. And so how how can um, businesses really leverage that unique position um, to engage their people more deeply in impact? And so, um, you know, what I would say is that it goes back to culture. Microsoft is primarily successful because they've cultivated a culture that really recognizes their people's passions. So you don't need to be a big company to do that. You can be a company of five, 10, 90 people and do that. And we have a number of, of um, small businesses who um, you know, use some of our solutions to engage their people in team volunteering, for example, going out and actually giving back together, solidifying those bonds. Um, you know, It's really interesting because when you see um, people volunteer, they tend to develop soft skills that then, then bring back into the business. Um, and there's team cohesion and connectedness because you're connecting on a personal level, not just a professional kind of work level. And so um, I would say it, it all comes down to culture and values, like like MJ was saying, you know, when you can align and on, on those values, then it doesn't have to be the same cause. You don't all have to care about the same cause. You just have to care about a cause. <laughs> and, and, and you just need a workplace that can nurture and, and, and kind of um, nourish those aspects of ourselves. And that will breed that level of loyalty. We love hanging out with people who bring out the best in us. So if your company or your culture can bring out the best in you, you're absolutely going to feel a much deeper connection with that business. Yeah. I can sit and listen to you guys all day. You should have your own podcast just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we will. <laughs> Maybe we will. Just throwing it out there, everybody. Uh, MJ, uh, listen, I so appreciate you joining us. I know you said you weren't feeling too well, but you're coming back. Are you still, I told you, you got that Bonnie Tyler sounding. I'm telling you, it's time <laughs> you should record a song right now. I'm telling I you. I know, right? Maybe you, I should. Maybe you, I should. You would, you would sound fantastic. Uh, let's leave uh, people with a little bit about, um, um, again, what you do there. I want to, I want people to kind of tune into what you've been doing. I want them to start following you. Uh, hey everybody, she got the coolest van in the world. Uh, if you want her, if she speaks at your event, she'll drive there, uh, you know, and she'll come and see you in this thing, which is beautiful. And I hope your beautiful partner is doing well as, um, what, what, uh, just tell everyone a little bit, uh, about again, the work that you're doing right there with Microsoft and, and, and then how it leans into this, what we're talking about, this idea of, finding a purpose because we, we talked earlier uh, myself and uh, and Sono about this idea that people are you know starving to find a sense of purpose and and don't just want to work uh, with a company that is kind of just all profit driven and I think people don't see Microsoft that way and I'm, I keep saying that but the reason why I say that is because we need to start seeing people as people <laughs> and and because you work with Microsoft uh, you can't you can't automatically have this vision of what people are like at a particular company and so on. So talk a little bit about, you know, what you're doing and how that relates directly to this conversation of transforming how people see Microsoft and giving back and being part of the community. Oh, thank you for this question. I am the global director for cultural and inclusive business impact. And that title has been a journey to develop and to become and it really started with exactly the scenario that you laid out is looking for a purposeful way to spend my time 
here at Microsoft, I really took to heart what Satya had said, which was don't work for Microsoft, make Microsoft work for you. And I was like, how do I do that? Like, what is that? What does that look like? And I didn't know. And the one thing that I did know is I had this incredible revelation working here. Uh, And it happened because a senior leader said some words that were very inclusive to the to the extent where I really felt like I had been in the past working as if I needed to be and look like something to be successful. So the version of myself, um, you know, in 2014, when I came back to Microsoft, I always talk about her as a cousin version of myself, uh, someone, nothing you know, wrong with the way that I looked, but I just didn't feel like that was my true authentic self. And when I heard the words, which by the way, he said, no matter what gender, ethnicity, or sexual orientation you are, you belong here and you have a role to play. Sexual orientation, that, that phrase is never said from uh, senior leadership, generally speaking in business, let alone my company and let alone um, a stage that large at the time, it was a big company meeting. Uh, now today's a lot different, but back then, only a, sh- a short time ago, it wasn't. And I just felt like, oh my God, I have a chance of really, like I felt like I was at home. Like I felt like I found a home or at least the chance that I had found home. And what it led to was the best work of my life. Nothing that I do today, the work that I was doing then was scaling a webcast channel for Microsoft advertising. And it was blowing up and it was blowing up because we were encouraged to share our true ideas, not saying yes and agreeing with, you know, whatever the storyline was in the meeting or in, in the room, right? Like it's about bringing our lived experience, bringing our true, you know, inner ideas that might be different than others. Mm-hmm. And in the true McKinsey study about homogenous teams versus heter- heterogeneous teams, those that are unlike each other, they don't perform very well at first, but then they outperform the other teams that agree really early. And I said, how do I scale that? That happened to me. I'm one person in 190,000 plus employees at Microsoft. How do we scale that magic? And that was when I started on this journey of how do you infuse inclusion in what I do really well, marketing, advertising, business development, strategy. What does that look like when you you overlap those two? And long story short, we did some research trust drivers of brands, the psychology of inclusion and the effects in advertising and marketing with purpose, a framework for building more trusted customer experiences was born. And it's truly this evergreen framework for building um, and deciding what activities, what products to build, um, what activities to support, to align with your mission, because it's all about being authentic, whether you're a human or brand. That is the number one brand attribute to building trust is authenticity. And so I scale this capability internally at Microsoft across different Microsoft um, business units. I do work for Microsoft advertising specifically, um, but I also empower our clients and our customers and I consult on their business. It's all about looking at the opportunities where we might be accidentally excluding and helping our customers and our and our clients see that opportunity as well. And when you get really close to people and really develop that empathy, that's the insight that you find is how you're accidentally excluding and, and you develop an innovative way to step in and solve that problem and grow your, your influence and grow your ability to drive impact across the world with more people and more businesses. And um, so an equitable approach to the power and the platform that we have, like how do we scale equity? And that's been my job for the last few years. And I'm so honored to walk this journey. And I'm, I hope someday that I'm not a job, but I hope it's everyone's job. This is just the way we do business, just the way we do marketing. There's no need for a unique title because this is like best practice, high quality, business, high quality operations, high quality advertising, high quality engineering. And that's it. 
Yeah, I love it. I love it. Hey, I got to bring this up because it just makes sense uh, to, to uh, round that out with this. What we we talked about earlier, we were talking uh, Sono about you know the five trends in corporate uh, purpose, and it was pulled from all of the organizations that you work with. But Microsoft, obviously, being a very large one, and so on. You know, every one of those things up there, right there, is something that you know, this conversation has touched on that MJ has just talked about, you know, this idea of business are stepping up and they're finding ways to be more resourceful within internally and so on. This idea of people are searching for purpose, uh, like in number two, for example, the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, um, uh, sorry, MJ, you just said about the idea, of, like you, you sometimes felt that you weren't part of that until someone stood up on stage and said, yeah, you have a home here. You belong here. You're part of that. Uh, the idea that there are multiple stakeholders, number four, and then of course the ESG, the social and the environmental part uh, and the governance and understand that that a company like Microsoft can see beyond the idea that, yes, of course, we're, we're a large company and, and, and profit is our business, but it's not the only thing we do, um, that there's much more to this to attract and keep good people. Uh, Sona, I, I don't think that uh, we missed a, a, a one of the the tricks there did we did we miss anything <laughs> no it was it was great and and i think there was there was a piece where um mj touched on something and now i'm of course drawing a blank but i was like you know that internal like yes <laughs> um, you know but i i think oh it was when mj said um this will be everybody's job and that's what i i truly believe that you know um goodness or philanthropy has been siloed in csr when you kind of extend, you know, out of philanthropy into goodness, it becomes, you know, a cultural thing and HR starts to get involved. But when you take it to purpose, everybody is thinking differently about what they bring to the company and how they can impact the world. And so I absolutely believe purpose is going to be a skill of the future for every single person in every single role. Um, so I just loved that MJ was, <laughs> was saying that as well, because I, I have the same belief. We're on to something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to guess you guys. Yeah, I'm going to guess you're both on to something there. That is for sure. Uh, MJ, listen, I can't tell you. You know how I feel about you already. You all know that. Warm you know, heart I'm, for you too, Peter. You are, you just, you just make my heart pump a little faster. I love it. <laughs> Mine and, too. Mine's still pumping faster. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm telling you, Sona, my, I, I can't stop smiling thinking that literally the universe spoke to you somehow today where you felt you felt her energy somewhere and it was so wild. By the way, i know that, i know that that's true because you mentioned her oh no you mentioned about this idea of having a company work for you and so on yeah uh and right away i thought yeah that's what that's what i remember mj saying at the and so yeah. that was, wow that is, that energy is just floating around here uh mj you know how i feel i listen i so appreciate you showing Thank up you. You, uh, I'm going to text you. You can, you can stay if you want, but I know you got to got things to do, but I'm going to text you when we're done. And, uh, if you want to jump on afterwards, the after show and, uh, say <laughs> hi again, uh, I will do that. But if I see you leave, I'll, the I'll stick around. So you stick around. Me you and stick around. Stick around. It, it is uh, so awesome to have you. I'm so, I'm so grateful. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll chat in a little bit here. We'll chat. Sounds great. Thank and you so much. Thank you. Okay. Oh, how cool is that? Oh my God, Peter, you're a magician. Oh, well, hey, it's, it's just great people. It's bringing together great people. That's what it is. It's uh, it's just what I love. I, I love to do it. I just I'm so grateful that uh, that MJ found some time today. She said, like she said, she wasn't feeling so well, and uh, but Aww. when I told her who she was going to be talking to, <laughs> uh, she was in. She was in. Uh, that was a beautiful conversation. Thank you, and I'm glad that you guys uh, had you know had that experience together of uh, meeting at the gathering. And uh, Stephanie, uh, you know, like I said, uh, she played a role in that, as did the other gentlemen. I don't want to leave Ryan Gill out. I don't want to leave Chris uh, Nealon out as well, and the full team. The full team, they do an amazing job there. And you were, you were, um, uh, you know, but Benevity was, was chosen as one of the brands out there. I think that's uh, just a one-liner that I need to hear from you. Like, I know that Benevity never thought of them, started their idea with being a brand or anything like that. Uh, how does that play out for you guys? What do you, what do you think of that about the idea of Benevity being like a global brand and being recognized as a global brand? I mean, it's, it's kind of surreal, um, but we have big dreams. And so it feels, um, it feels, it feels good, but it just, I just feel like we're scratching the surface. And so, um, you know, when we look at the world, we just need, we know that the world needs more of benevity and more goodness. And so 
um, we're never um, satiated. We, we are hungry for more goodness. And so it was an incredible honor to be recognized as a, as a cult brand honoree. Um, and it was, it was definitely an emotional moment um, where you see how far you've come. Uh, which I think is important when you're working in, in the impact space because it can feel like you never get to the end. Um, and so it, it's nice to have a milestone where you can say, okay, we've, we've hit a level of achievement that you know, is, is, um, is important because it, it acts as fuel for us to go the distance. Yeah, I, I I remember. Yeah, I remember that it was very emotional for you. You were you were fantastic, and what I what I loved about it, it wasn't just on stage. You were, you know, just I, I was I, emotional I was, all week. Yeah, <laughs> I was watching your interaction with people, and it was so, like I said, it was just at a different level. There was a different level of connection with people there, and and um, and I know you sensed it. I know that you sensed that. Wow, like we're we're going to another level, and I'm part of it, and I'm. I'm part of the team that's driving that. That's a that's a very very cool experience. Uh, I want to take you on a little quick little uh, journey here as well uh, to show you another thing I learned about you at the at the at the gathering, which was which was fantastic. Um, and I just think it's important because it 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 resonated so much with me. But I resonated with Renuk. It resonated with everybody I spoke to when when you spoke. You had your presentation um not not at the actual uh, gala but when you did your separate presentation you talked about something that really moved me and i'm wondering if you can talk to this and uh hey this is gonna be fun let me just uh, show you something that this is not the actual one everybody just so you know but uh let me just see if this uh, resonates with you at all uh i saw i heard you talk about some beautiful soul that that said to you uh you know be a radio be that radio and broadcast your message to the world and here we are doing it right now and so on talk to us about that beautiful soul over there and uh that phrase and and how that came about because you uh you, you told us that story and it was, it was so powerful yeah it was um so this is my mom uh and her name was ruby and uh i you know as a kid uh my we were sitting at the family dinner table and uh, my family said, you know, hey, you know, what do you want to be? That typical question, right? What do you want to be when you grow up? And uh, I was five, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, just trying to make everyone laugh. I said, oh, I want to be a radio. And uh, I thought it'd be funny to be an inanimate object. Um, fast forward 35 years later, <laughs> and, you know, uh, uh, I'm having a conversation with my mom and she's kind of, you know, watching, watching my career uh, evolve and develop. And she's like, you know, you, you really might want to do more speaking, like you really have a gift coming back to that conversation of, you know, gifts, passions and purpose. She, you know, you have a real gift. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I really have anything to say. Um, and then a few years later, my mom was diagnosed uh, with a rare form of leukemia. And she actually uh, passed away within 13 days of her diagnosis. Mm. Um, and uh, but in that 13 days, I got to spend time with her in the hospital. and. Um, because of my Jungian background, we'd talk about our dreams and analyze our dreams. And uh, I had had this uh, dream and I was sharing it with my mom and my mom reached out and touched my hair. And she said, you know, Sona, I've always seen you differently than you've seen yourself. And literally, Peter, in that moment, it was like I could see myself from her eyes mm -hmm. and I could see that I had a strength and a gift and actually i did have something to say to the world um and on my 40th birthday my mom had written in a in a in a birthday card you know your time is coming like be that radio broadcast your message to the world and um and so at the gathering was tremendously emotional because it was the third anniversary of my mom's diagnosis the day i was presenting mm -hmm. and um and so it was it felt like so much more than just a talk for me. It felt like the fulfillment of a soul promise um, and coming full circle into that um, being, you know, I think the thing is sometimes we think, oh, our purpose is just, we're gonna know it and we're gonna live it. But I don't think it really ever happens like that. It, it unfolds, it blooms and it takes its time. And I would say that that time at the gathering uh, was kind of a full bloom for me. 
Um, so yeah, it was tremendously powerful. And the ironic thing is that the message is about purpose, <laughs> which, right. which is, you know, a uh, very meta. <laughs> Right. I, I think it just, it, yeah, it just, well, especially, I mean, you were talking about the idea of the anniversary and then, and I heard the story about, uh, you know, from the diagnosis till, till she, she, uh, she left was only 13 days. So you had a very short period of time to have some of these intimate uh, conversations yeah. and moments and so on. And, uh, I just thought it was super courageous to to share it. And uh, what I do regret, uh, by the way, I I recorded that uh, uh, audio part, so I've listened to that before, and uh, and that's the only reason I don't have a picture. Because when you showed the picture of you and your mom, your mom said, "Wouldn't it be cool if we were on stage at the stage same together. time?" And yeah. uh, and you had a picture of her and yourself, and I thought, oh, "Okay, that's a that's full circle and yeah. very powerful." I don't have my mom either, so I know. Um, I relate so much when you were telling that story. I was like, wow, I just, I just relate to that. So anyone who has a, you know, a parent missing in their lives, they can relate to a story where, again, the, the influence that they have on your life and the impact, you don't recognize it until you kind of go, look back and connect oh, us, right. You don't, you don't see it while you're in real time, but you get a chance to, uh, and I'm so glad you had those 13 days to have some of those conversations. Cause I thought that was just, uh, beautifully said and so on uh thank you for sharing that i wanted to people to know that how, yeah. how how much influence that your mom had on you and i love those messages i love when she said that to you she said hey, i always seen you differently than you've seen yourself and uh we don't normally hear that from parents uh yeah. i, I I'm, I'm just being honest i i don't think i've ever heard that from my my parents in the past yeah. and and we don't get a chance to go oh i i, I wonder how you do see me you know yeah. I, I always wonder what my mom would think of me now. Like, you know, we always think those things. What would she, and just like you, I'm sure she'd be saying, wow. Uh, I think, she I think would, she'd be would, tremendously proud. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking for you. Like she did to, <laughs> to see you on the stage and to be leading a, a large organization and to have these conversations. And she's thinking, yeah, that's how I've always seen you. That's just magic. I think that's. Yeah, she would have loved uh, if I could send her a picture to beyond of her on stage with me. I think she just would have been thrilled. <laughs> right. <I laughs> yeah, she, she always loved being on stage. She was a phenomenal speaker. And when she said she said, you know, I think you should speak. I was like, oh, and she's like, maybe we could be on stage together. I was like, oh, she's like, you're amazing. You can be on stage. <laughs> you can be on stage. Not me. That's not for me. That's not for me. Hey, you know, this is the direction I wanted to take you because I know, again, Ben Ebony, this is your issue is some of your life work now, not some of it. it it's, it's predominant to you to your life right now, but there's all kinds of different things in that. So I I, I have to take you on this little journey very quickly here. Um, I need you to um just think of the first thing that kind of popped in your mind here. I, I want to do something called uh, reflections, reflections with uh, Sona. That's what we're going to do right now. And uh, the reason why I want to do this, because again, it gives me a better understanding, gives everyone a better understanding of, you know, your purpose there at uh, Benevity, who you are and, and, and things like that. So I just, I think it's always a very powerful thing. Uh, let's click through and see, uh, see who we can find here. Who are uh, these beautiful people? Who are these beautiful people? That is Bruce, my husband, and Gracie, our um, our Labradoodle, who has made us a family. Uh, she's just absolutely the love of our lives. And she's yeah. still going. She's fourteen now. That was when I, she was a pup. <laughs> I know she's fourteen. I knew. I knew she's really old because I was kind of yeah. doing the math in my head of the pictures <laughs> and stuff. I was like, oh no, she's up there. So uh, she's got lots of time. I my, I had my. <laughs> I had my Tia for uh, 16 and a half years. So there you go. So you, you, got, uh, you got lots of time. You got lots of time here. Uh, I love this. Uh, what are those? What's the list there? Tell us a little bit about that. I love it. Yeah. So um, my husband and I, when we, so we'd been together 10 and a half years before we decided to have a marriage ceremony. Um, and actually, my mom performed our ceremony in Belize. Oh. And um, we were, I, I come from a Hindu background. And so um, I was reading about Hindu ceremonies and and there's there's this element of the the ceremony where you walk around a fire and you you circumambulate this fire and you make promises to each other. And I was like, oh, I wonder what those promises are. And when I started to look them up, it was like, we'll have lots of cattle, we'll have lots of sons. And I was like, mm, I don't feel like that's quite where we're at. <laughs> and so Bruce and I decided to write our own seven promises to each other. And these are the promises that we wrote. And you know, it's it's interesting because. Um, there are times that are, you know, challenging in a relationship and you come back to these promises and say, 
okay, I actually promised to respect your journey or I promised to dream with you. I used to be known as the dream killer. Bruce would be like, why don't we do this? And I'd be like, well, we can't do that because of this, 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 and this. And so that was his <laughs> ask, was, you know, promise to dream with me. And so, yeah, we come back, these are touchstones. Um, and actually, you know, I haven't looked at this in a while. It's it's a good reminder of the commitments that that we've made to each other. Oh, but these are the ones we wanted to, to um uh, walk the fire together with and promise each other. I love it. I, I just, I, I so resonate with that. Now I understand. I didn't know that part of you about you, but now I know why uh, yourself and Renuka connect so much because this is her language and, um, and she has a Hindu background as well. So oh, okay. there's that connection point. So I, I'm starting to understand yeah. now why that, <laughs> I'm starting to see a little bit of, uh, all the connection. Who are these beautiful people? Who are oh all my these gosh. people? <laughs> <laughs> is, are you gonna, being, are you gonna be mad at me later for showing all no, of these? No, no. But this is my older sister, Rachna. She's seven years older than me, um, and I just worshipped her. I always wanted to be like her. You can kind of see it in that top sure. left picture. She was, of course, seven years older, so she was like, "I don't want to have anything to do with you." But she complied yeah. with my dad, who made us. You know, he would dress us up and take photos of us around the house. And this is like back in the you know early '80s, late '70s. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there were dressed up in a lot of my mother's uh, real clothing, like her scarves and jewelry as gypsies. We were gypsies every year because my mom had so much like gaudy stuff. That yeah, we just wear. I, I know. I heard about your mom's like that's a, hey, that's a podcast in itself. The the stories yeah. of, your, of your mom and and yeah. and and all of the spiritual journey and oh, it's it's fantastic stuff. But I can I can see why there's a lot of joy there. I'm going to assume that these are uh, the the, uh, the, me and the my sister, and yeah. Here. Yeah, she's she's the best big sister because she um always just let me be who I needed to be. Like she never, I, and maybe part of that was age, but also just her nature is like deeply unconditional. She's like a dog; like she just loves you no matter what. And so, <laughs> like I have done, I don't know. Like I am not, you know, the typical kind of younger sister or whatnot. But she's never judged me. Uh, overtly anyways, <laughs> um, and never held me back and never tried to contain me. And I just, I feel so grateful to have had um, and still have uh, her as my sister. Oh, I love that. I love the idea that uh, you're like, you're, you're friends, like you're friends, right? I mean, yeah. you're, of course, it's just at a different level. I get that. Who are these? Uh, <laughs> group of people? Uh, so this is, I'm, I'm sandwiched between my two nephews, uh, Arjun and Amin. Yeah. Um, and then in the back is my stepmom and my brother-in-law. And then my dad made it into the into the bottom photo there. There you go. <laughs> yeah, this was, I, I think, a it. birthday. And Bruce and my sister. Yeah, so it's a family portrait. Go. A little Gracie in there. Got a little Gracie in there as well on the side. Yeah. It's all good. And I see the same uh, same yeah. people who are involved as well. This is your... This is yeah. my dad. Dad. Yeah, he's a, He's, he was um, a global economist for mobile and an engineer. He had hoped I would be an engineer. Then he hoped I would be a pilot and then he gave up. And now he hopes I'll be a CEO, but I have to dash those dreams too. There's no way. <laughs> oh, hey, uh, I think he, he probably sees the future for you. No, he sees. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, what, what, what did you learn most from your dad? What do you, what do you think you pulled uh, most from your dad? I mean, obviously there's tons of things, but I'm, I'm thinking yeah. that's, that's predominant for you. Um, you know, my dad is, um, well, first of all, when it comes to finances, my God, this guy's amazing. So like he, he's my investment advisor, but he's also my thinking function. You know, when you do the Myers-Briggs, I'm an, I'm an ENFP and I'm an off the charts feeling F like crazy. And so, uh, my dad has helped me develop my thinking function. So, um, and he taught me decision analysis actually, uh, when I was quite young. <laughs> and so I still use it to make big decisions in my life. But um, yeah, my dad's a grounded, um, you know, very logical, um, sensible, but he is actually coming back to what you said earlier, Peter, he is the person who has taught me that if you don't have your health, you have nothing. Mm. And uh, he has been a health nut his whole, you know, my whole life anyways. And um, yeah, he's always said, don't let anything destroy your health because without your health, you have nothing. Oh, okay. I so resonate with that and i think a lot of people watching this can resonate with that as well yeah health is wealth it really really you everyone who's been there and, and knows what we're referring to there that's a great message uh i think that we know who this beautiful person is that's uh i just think i just love the stories that you've told and and yeah. 
we're, this one is looks like a happy birthday, but it looks like Christmas time as well. So yeah, my mom was a Sagittarius, born in December. So um, nice. and she loved having all the attentions. <laughs> she loved having her photo taken. Like the 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 thing that we used to we used to talk about death a lot actually in our family and like you know how would you you know how do you what do you want with your remains and how would you want your life celebrated? And my mom was like. Okay, first of all, I want lots of good pictures of myself. <laughs> <laughs> and there needs to be really good food and uh, and a jazz band. And uh, so I so there's lots of photos of my mom. And you know, it was really annoying at the time. Like when my mom got her iPhone, she was amazing at taking photos and doing videos. She's got like eleven thousand Instagram followers, even though she's been gone for three years. <laughs> like she's she was doing live meditations on on Instagram and stuff, and like she's just amazing. And Facebook Live, like a really like into her late sixties, was adopting technology. And my sister and I used to get so annoyed. We'd be like, "Gosh, she's like a teenager. The phone is always in her hand." Oh. But when she died, we were like, "Everything is recorded. Everything." And it's just a treasure and a gift. And so my sister actually publishes a lot of her stuff. And, you know, I think when we're in challenging times, she'll, you know, pop something up or send something to me. And it's, now we're like, thank God, she was quite a content creator. <laughs> wow. You know, you just said uh, this this gift of uh, hearing her voice, for example, having her voice. And uh, so she recorded herself and so on. I think that's magical right there because uh, I know the few times that I've recorded a few people that, you know, then they end up not being here anymore. Yeah. Those become treasures for people, uh, treasures really? where they say, Peter, did you record that? And I think, yeah, I think I did. And I'll send it to them and they'll just, you know, and I know for me, uh, I can openly say, like, I sadly can say that. I sometimes I don't know if I would recognize my mom's voice anymore. I don't, I haven't heard her for so long. I don't know. So I'm, I'm always, uh, was kind of saddened that, uh, you know, the technology wasn't, uh, there. it wasn't in our hands at that time and so on. I just want to show, there's another beautiful picture of you guys. Um, there she is. She loves pictures. I love it. <laughs> you know, with Renuka as well. Renuka is a December baby too, just so you know. So yeah, so Sagittarians, they require, you know, the space to be all of them. <laughs> <laughs> all of that. Absolutely. Yeah. But these yeah. are beautiful uh, pictures. Uh, they, to show. I really like this one, by the way. I just think yeah. that yeah, there's, there's something reflective in that one. I like that one. Yeah, you can never dress up too much either. Like you could literally go to McDonald's and my mom would be dressed up. <laughs> I love it. I yeah, love everything it. Everything was an occasion. It was actually really like it's taught me like, you know, you don't have to have a big occasion to really like treat right. it like a big occasion. <laughs> you don't. I listen, I couldn't agree with you more on that. I mean, I, like you said, I, I'm kind of, you know, what, I'm kind of like that, to be honest with you. I don't like just going out in sweatpants and stuff. It's okay. I mean, but I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do your hair. <laughs> you know, just, exactly. do, do your hair. You know, just, Make it as big as you can. <laughs> yeah. Just go, go with that. Go with that. Hey, I just want to put in here. Uh, listen to this. I love this. There's MJ there. I want, there's so many amazing uh, uh, comments in here. Uh, I want to, I want, I'm going to go back and I'll, everybody in the comments, we're going to be going back and checking that. And, uh, this is fantastic. I want to see there's, yeah. there's so many amazing people here tuning in, uh, wish was here. Oh, there you go. Yes, of course. Thank you, Dr. Ron. Appreciate that. Uh, Hey, you can, you can always come back and, and see a little bit about what, what we've been doing here. Uh, I, I know you, I, I know you got to go cause you're on a, so you're not on a sabbatical, you're not on a sabbatical right now. You're just on an extended vacation. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> right now? Yeah, that's all right. Just taking a few weeks off. I was hoping to, uh, practice some non-doing, but I went into hyper doing <laughs> so, working on my will and my investments and my mortgage and like all those things. But actually now a weekend I'm settling in and finding some beautiful moments of stillness and quiet, wow. which has been fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. See, I love that. I love that. You've been on a magical journey. Uh, we didn't even touch on your journey, your business journey. I mean, we haven't even touched on that. That's what I'm saying. Like we could just go for hours here, but what are you most proud of so far? Uh, your journey to date, where you're, where you are, and what, what, what makes you most proud right now of uh, everything you might have done to get to this point? I know there's so much coming. I mean, there's a lot more to come, obviously. But what would you oh. say you're proud about in your journey so far? You know, I I struggle with that question because I'm um, one of those people who's always like, I can be better. I could do better. I could be more. And so, um, but I think. You know, I think the thing I'm most probably proud of, and this is coming straight from the heart, is the people I've surrounded myself with. Mm. Um, I think I've, 
have chosen well. They are people who have made me better um, and have shown me what it is to love and to um, live fully. And I, I think, you know, I really do believe that you become who you're with. And so I think I have chosen um, my circles wisely. I love that. I'm so just taking all of that in. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, you, you really geography and, you know, where, where you're physically born and raised and then the people that you are obviously around by, not by choice when you're younger, but then as you get older, you get a chance to choose those people. And, and then that, that also adds up to be the reflection of who you are, a combination of things that you can't control and th some of the things you can control. I think that's beautiful. Cause you, when you said that you were saying it with a big smile, which means yeah. that you really feel like you have uh, your tribe showing up, which I think it's uh, it's really fantastic. Let me ask you this. It's been a very difficult couple of years. You know this, I mean, because you're on the front end of this. I mean, let's yeah. say you're connecting with hundreds of organizations and million, literally millions of people, whether it's customers and employees and so on. Um, and you just have to turn on the news and, and literally in two minutes, you're not feeling too good. Uh, it's not very hopeful sometimes. And we're talking about giving and finding purpose and meaning and all those things. What what keeps you hopeful and optimistic these days? What what works for you in the world of hopeful and optimism? Um, you know, I think the the biggest thing for me over the last little while was um, I gave up on the news back in probably about 2015. Um, but I recently pretty much gave up on social media and. Um, the the thing I found was that my real life interactions were nothing like what was happening on social media. And so when I feel I would be despairing when I would be on social media, but when I was in my real life interactions, I would be like, these are good people. Like the level of open mindedness, the willingness for civil debate and disagreement, um, and then the kindness and the thoughtfulness that is what gives me hope. So I, I would say coming into real life actually gives me hope. Wow. I never heard that before, but you know what? That just makes so much sense to me. And I couldn't, I, when I'm with people, yeah. you can have conversations that where you could be literally maybe uh, completely polar opposite of maybe what your opinion might be. But it's still there's civility built in. There's a little bit of kindness in there. And you can just say, hey, okay, well, I never thought of it that way. And okay. And versus what you're referring to uh, in, in, in some of the platforms of uh, social media and, 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 and how we can kind of sort of hide behind that. So those conversations, you know, where, where the civility seems to be gone, the ability to, to agree with uh, some sort of uh, wanting to understand as well. We can agree, but then also have a curiosity of wanting to understand exactly. it. Uh, I agree with you. There's so, there's hope in the fact of gathering again, thus the gathering again. There you go. <laughs> we're plugging those guys all day, aren't we? All day long. That's all we're doing. We've been plugging those guys. Yeah, I got to get out to those guys. They got to do some a uh, little bit of uh, sponsorship here or something. Hey, <laughs> before you go, we got to do one more thing just before you go. Uh, okay. little this or that, little this or that. Yeah, we got to do a little of this or that. We got to learn a little bit more about you. You got to know what Soma's all about. <laughs> I know. I know you're thinking like, didn't you tell my whole story with my mom and, and all that? Stuff? But, uh, it still gives us a, a really cool idea of who you are. So there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, I'll just name two things and you just uh, just pick this or that. As simple as that. Okay. So, here we go. Uh, Supergirl or Wonder Woman? Uh, Wonder Woman. Oh, okay. Like the plane. I'm going to guess the plane. Is it the plane or what is it? <laughs> I don't know. I just like the name. <laughs> no, let's do it that way. Uh, you two or Coldplay? Oh, Coldplay. Really? After Bono yeah. invested in your company? I know. I love Bono for what he does in the world, but I like Coldplay's music. I do too. Just, <laughs> I love it. That's a hard one. Just so you know, that's a hard one. Uh, scuba dive or uh, skydive? Scuba dive. Have you done both or either? Uh, no, I've just snorkeled. I had a, like, I was terrified of fish till I was about 35. So <laughs> I've just started snorkeling, but I'm, I'm a go deep person. I like, I like depth I, and it's. I get it. Okay. All right. No, no right or wrong. How about better age? Uh, 25 years old or 45 years old? Uh, 
Oh, 45, hands down. I turned 45 last month. It's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, it's a good place to be. What, what, what and, and, and 25, what, why? Uh, just, Ugh, why? I was a neurotic mess. I was having my quarter life crisis at 25. <laughs> um, I don't know. You know, I just, I think I was so living in a world where I was comparing myself to everybody else, like so externally oriented. And I've finally done enough of my own work and um, come to a place where I think I'm a little, I'm so much more comfortable with myself and I know there's more to go, but now it's like, I can be more of myself, um, but also still be mindful of my impact on people. So it's not authenticity and at all costs. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's authenticity with awareness of my impact. And um, so I, I, I like being, I like getting older. It's awesome. Yeah. And I'm actually healthier than I was when I, I was like, I like ate cheeseburgers. I got kicked out of McDonald's drive through. Like I loved fast food. <laughs> now it's like, I'm way healthier. I actually feel better physically I, too. I still relate to that. I, I know exactly what you mean. I just, there's just a lostness at 25 I, for me. Anyway, I know what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Now you're getting older. It's like, and it's a privilege to get older, by the way. It's not everyone's it really that night, you not know? guaranteed. It's never guaranteed, everybody. So uh, I think that's good. Hey, if we go out and do something, uh, are we going for Chinese food or Italian food? Oh, Italian food. We'll go to Villa Firenze and I will have their gnocchi with pesto. <laughs> Villa Firenze in Bridgeland. I can't. And this is in Calgary for those of you in Calgary or for those of you who visit Calgary. It's incredible. Okay. I've never, I don't think I've been. So, oh. okay. I, I just I'll take note of that. I take note of that. Uh, I know you love to travel and so on. Uh, Caribbean or Europe? Europe. Europe. Yeah, like the old, like older historic things and yeah, yeah. things like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There you go. Hey, uh, you're talking philanthropy for a full day with somebody. Bono or Al Gore? Uh, I think. Oh, they're. You know, I got to meet Al Gore recently, and he oh, is so kind. Um. He's so I feel like I'd choose Bono only because I got to spend time with Al Gore already. <laughs> oh, hey, that's a, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> that's yeah, a good problem yeah. to have. No, <laughs> I, I, I sense that he would be like that. I, I've never met, well, either one of them, Such but. Such a uh, gentleman. And so like, you know, you think you're nobody, but they don't make you feel like you're nobody. It's, that's a pretty phenomenal gift for someone of his stature and his um, experience. I agree with you. I'll, I'll do that. Uh, um, I'll do that name dropping thing. <laughs> I heard this joke with someone said, Hey, Elton John told me never to name drop. Okay. Never do that. <laughs> anyway, uh, I had the same experience when I spent some time with Richard Branson. Uh, he, oh, he, yeah? like that. he feels, he makes you feel like you were the only person. And he, he is, he's talking to you, yeah. uh, not distracted. And he's just engaging. He's leaning into you. And I just think that is a super skill when people have this, you know, incredible oh. social currency. There's so many people at you all the time and yet they can make you feel like, wow, I'm just talking to you right now. That is a great, yeah. well, that's good to know about him. That's good to know about him. How about this courage or character? <laughs> I think character is kind of fun. <laughs> that's, that's good. Okay. There's no right or wrong. No yeah, right. Yeah. It's all good. It's one of my favorite ones right now. Here's my favorite ones. Hope or freedom. Oh, that's a really tough one, Peter. <laughs> Coming out of a pandemic, that's a really hard one. Um, I'm, but I'm still going to go with hope because I, I do think freedom is a state of mind to some extent. No right or wrong. I love that answer. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I, yeah, and, and I think, and I, I don't know what it's like to have zero hope but i i know that feeling of hopelessness boy that's a dark place yeah. too. Uh, not yeah. having freedom is certainly dark uh, not yeah. having uh your free or sorry any hope that's uh that's a scary place to be yeah that's scary. that's a tough one peter yeah, that's <laughs> a tough one. That's, hey hey you you're the one that woke up thinking about your will the other day so <laughs> <laughs> it, wasn't it wasn't me but I, now that you said it i have to do this uh i'm gonna have to look at my will as well um <laughs> uh, let me ask you to finish with this sentence right here um i love my life because i mean i just i love life I, that's all like it's just it's not even my life it's life um so what's not to love yeah, I agree. It's okay. 
it's so fragile. I mean, I can tell you from it really moment, is. It's moment to moment. We I can understand why we think um, you know, we don't think like again that it, yeah, of course it can't happen to me. It happens to other people. Yeah. And so I mean it makes because if you thought about it all day long, it'd just be very depressing. But it it is truly moment to moment. And um, yeah, and the fact that you're doing it and just being here and just breathing and using your yeah. eyes and it's having, a miracle. It is a miracle, isn't it? It just but you know, I had this I had this thought um recently and, and I think a lot more about death since of course my mom passed and I do I do think death is just another state. Um and you know, like and you you see that walking in the forest, right? Like you can see all states of thriving, surviving, dying, and decaying. And that full spectrum is life. So when I think about life, I don't think of being alive. I think about the entire spectrum of consciousness in a way that has various states of manifestation. I did have a very dark thought, which is, I wonder if actually death is even better than life. Like, I'm just curious, maybe it is. Because coming back to your thing about hope and freedom, like imagine not having the limitations of space, time, or a body. Like no knee pain, like no, <laughs> no insecurity. Just right? no insecurity, no knee pain would be amazing. <laughs> Just no, I, I I resonated with the no knee pain. I mean that sincerely. I have a knee pain, but yeah. Yeah. But you're yeah. right. On. That, that's a fascinating question. I've never heard it. I, I and I know what you mean. You're not meaning it in a dark way. You're meaning it no. is. It's just another state of being. Yeah. And what what is that going to be like, or what is it like? And and yeah, it's fascinating. I I, I love where you're going with that. Hey, that's Carl Jung. There you go. Yeah, I know. There's deep. That's the deep. That's the depth we're talking about here. You talk about yeah. you said I love de uh, depth. So I like going go. deep. <laughs> I see that. I see that. Sometimes it's not appropriate, but you know, meaning it's not right for the right context. I'll like go really deep. People are like, oh, and I'm like, oh yeah, okay, we're just having this conversation. Okay. Yeah, hey, <laughs> I can come back up. <laughs> it's fine. You can you can you can take us there anytime. I'm uh, that's the conversation. That's why we don't have a lot of friends. Uh we go <laughs> that's our conversations right here all the time. Really yeah. super deep. It's funny that you mentioned though about this other consciousness and so on. I just I just want to add to that. That's not from or does that come from a little bit from the the idea of Hinduism and maybe in the idea of reincarnation and coming back? And I'm only asked that because I'll, I'll i'll tell you why in a second but it, it, does it come from any of that sort of uh, upbringing and i'm still the jury is out for me on reincarnation okay. um which is funny because i grew up hindu and believing it and then i i started to question it and now i just don't know but i do i do believe uh i guess i believe it's arrogant to think that this is it there's just no way this is it. There's just no way. Like, because we're discovering new things. You know, we're discovering that trees warn other trees when there is like a danger. We're learning that mushrooms are like actually really great when for the longest time they're like, there's no value in mushrooms. Like, I just, what we know is a fraction of what is to be known. So I just, I guess I extend that and I just think, yeah, there's got to be more. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's really good. I, what the reason why it's, um, yeah, curious. Uh, the reason why it, it 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 struck me is I heard this phrase, and I I didn't see my Renika brings up, and uh, and again, not we don't we talk about it a little bit, but the idea of reincarnation stuff. That's the only thing that really scares me. Like it scares me the idea of like being somebody or something else. Yeah. Um, I don't know why that scares me, but it just really frightens me. And 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 I never so I you know just dis dismiss it and just so because it comforts your brain, right? Uh, but then I heard that quote or a, a little a story about Eleanor Roosevelt being asked that question of Do you believe in reincarnation? Uh, and I'm going to research again to make sure that that quote is appropriate. But she said, Well, it, and when someone said again, Do you believe in reincarnation? She said, Well, it wouldn't be any stranger for me to show up in another life as I did in this one. Hmm. And I went boom! It just oh, uh, yeah. that that doesn't that sound like that's yeah. possible? Yeah, that one that's that scared that scared me. <laughs> scared yeah, that's that's a, that's a penny drop moment. I also think we're you're not the same as you were 20 years ago. Like, right. so you're kind of already not the same. Right, you're so right. You know, you talk about aging, right? The person you were at 25 is certainly not at 45. Certainly not. Not a, you, even every couple of years, you're just a yeah. different person. And what is and it? So cellular like, at your the body cellular body. level, you're also not the same person, right? What is it? Every seven years, I think it is yeah. that your entire body is a different body cell select uh, uh, at the cell level. Uh, that, 
That's unbelievable. I know. Yeah. See, I love this kind of stuff. See, that's why we, you and I be over in the corner and people go, <laughs> I, think I think they're going deep again. <laughs> you got to let them go. Uh, Sona, it's just been an unbelievable pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I knew it was going to be, and this is why I begged, begged to, to, to get on. A, and I, listen, I want to tell everybody that you're taking a month off. This was on your calendar. You could have easily just said, Peter, uh, I'm taking some time off. Leave me alone. And you didn't. And I so appreciate that. I just, it just says so much about you as a person. And, um, I just, I just honor that. So thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Peter. And in all honesty, I felt like this would be such good energy. And so I was like, I actually want to do it. So oh, I that's... want to spend time with you. And then MJ shows up and it just gets better. <laughs> right, right. Oh, she, she's magical. She goes, oh, yeah. She says, text me because I stepped away from my laptop. I'll be right back. <laughs> There you go. She wants, to, she wants to see you. So we're going to do that. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Everybody who's tuning in, we're going to go through the, I'm going to go through the comments. Uh, Sona, if you get a chance, you know, just, I know you're not on social media, but LinkedIn specifically, a lot of people reach out and, and learn about uh, uh, people in, and again, we're talking about uh, Benevity. So the corporate world and so on and thought leaders and, and business leaders, you know, you want to learn about more about Benevity, please. Here's the website. Uh, you can check that out there. Uh, there's so much going on with their their information at Benevity Impact Labs. They have a report that you can pull down. Fantastic stuff. So please do that. Read about it. And again, you know, read it from the eye perspective. How does this affect me? What can I learn from it? How can I engage? Uh, learn about what Benevity is. And you don't have to be a giant corporation to do this. You can be a small business, locally, regional. Uh, learn more about it by just going to the website and trying to figure out where you fit in because you do. If you if you you know if you're a human being. You fit in. <laughs> Would that be a safe assumption, Sona? Yes. Absolutely. There we go. That's what we have, everybody. So thank you so much, uh, Sona. I appreciate it. Everybody else, hey, uh, thank you for tuning in. And you know how we end this around here. I'll see you on the other side, of course, uh, Sona. Everybody else, hey, I think I'll go leave you with a little, uh, my little philanthropy trip, uh, a trip I did in uh, Rwanda, uh, Sona. I'll leave you with that one. So a little, little clip from that. Um, it makes me always feel grateful when I see it. It just reminds me of uh, how blessed we are. Uh, we've all won certain lotteries in the world. I always think living in Canada, we've won the birth lottery, to be frank with you. Uh, yep. <laughs> uh, be grateful all the time and uh, help where you can and all those kinds of things. Everybody else, you know how we uh, finish this thing. Uh, just be kind out there. I mean, that's all you have to do. You just have to be kind. Right, Sona? Just be Amen. kind, everybody. <laughs> kind, that's all you have to do. See you on the other side, Sona. Uh, thanks, everybody. See you Thank next you time. Thank you so much. Bye. So I found a new friend and uh, we traded uh, a pen um, for this soccer ball. And I thought it was really nice because I just gave him the pen because he'd been helping uh, helping me throughout the day to learn uh, Kinyarwanda. And uh, he's a very smart boy, knows English very well. Very good English. Yes. So I gave him a pen, um, which they love pens. and. Um, 15, 10, 15 minutes later, he came back and gave me a ball for the trade. So I just thought that was really, really cool because I didn't ask for it. So, so. Umupira. 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 Yeah, Pira. Yeah, so he gave me that. So I'm really, really happy about that. And I'll be bringing this back to Canada. And uh, yeah, I thought it was awesome. He's, he's a really, really, really clever kid. He's going to be an English teacher. Professor. Professor. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.